Amen. Uh, someone has asked, or maybe you have asked the question, well, what does it mean to have a relationship with the Lord? And we talked about, first of all, the relationship starts with faith. It starts with you placing your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. But then we start to think that uh, or we start to look at the word of God and the word of God tells us that <clears throat> because you have faith, you also have fellowship. And what we said is that fellowship <clears throat> is like a companionship or a companionship or a companion with one another. But it goes even deeper than companionship It's more of a partnership. You are partaking of the goodness of God. You're partaking of the goodness of his people. So that's where we're going to be heading. We're going to be talking about conduct in fellowship. How you ought to act because you are a child of God. Father, we're so grateful and thankful for your word today. We ask now, Father, that you would uh, now show us the way, the only way, with fellowship with you is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that you would transform our mind, our hearts. And I pray, God, that the word would draw near to someone who's seeking truth. Thank you, Lord, for the reading of the word. Thank you, Lord, for, oh, God, uh, the word changing us. Because your word is living. And I ask you right now that you and now give me the words to say to your people. As it already has been prayed, I pray again that, Lord, you will be glorified in this hour and in this moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right in, if you're in 1 John chapter 2, I would like to call your attention to verse, uh, beginning at verse 3 of 1 John chapter 2. And it reads, <clears throat> and 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to begin at verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to you today about conduct in fellowship. Conduct in fellowship, um, a true, genuine relationship with the Lord involves fellowship with the redeemed, fellowship with God the Father and God the Son. It involves fellowship. So once you place your faith in Christ, you are saved. There is no question here about salvation. You are saved once you place your faith in Christ. There is then fellowship with God and his son 
and his people. Sin interrupts fellowship, but not salvation. Let me say it again. Sin interrupts fellowship, but not salvation. Salvation is the one-time act whereby God saved you when you place your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. But this was by his grace. So no one could boast in their works. Now, once you are saved, you are always saved. Once you are saved, you are always saved. Since you are saved, then you should have fellowship with the redeemed, with the saved. <laughs> you should have fellowship with the Lord and his son, Jesus Christ. And so here, the apostle John, he's telling us that there should be some characteristics of what fellowship looks like. And he describes that here in chapter 2. And I want you to understand that God, he wants you and your joy to be made full and complete. That's what he says in 1 John chapter 1. If you look at that, he says that... Uh, in the third verse, it says that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with him, with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Now, here is his purpose of a writing. Look at verse four. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Fellowship is important. It is important for the redeemers because the reason why fellowship is important is because your joy will be complete. Your joy will be complete. Fellowship is also on the same level as your salvation. When you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there was joy in your heart for coming to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And something happened on the inside. Jesus, he put his Holy Spirit on the inside of you so that you are saved. You are saved and you have Christ on the inside of you. And I am joyful because of who I know. Because I am his, because I have eternal life. But I want you to understand something here. And, and I want you to get this. He says... In verse 4, our joy may be complete. This writing main purpose is to create joy in the readers. Anybody who reads is to create joy. When you read 1 John, there should be joy in your heart because of the promises in Scripture, because of what God is saying about fellowship. And all of everything that comes along with it, the proclamation of the reality of the gospel in verses one, two, it produces a fellowship in eternal life. It produces a fellowship in eternal life. And we see that in that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim. What are we proclaiming? We're proclaiming what? The gospel. The gospel produces fellowship. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that produced fellowship. If you do not have fellowship in the church, and if you are, if you're looking to have fellowship in the church, you need to preach Jesus. You need to focus your attention on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everyone in the pews should be speaking the gospel to other people because the gospel brings fellowship the gospel brings fellowship and I know 
We live in a time right now where you just want to go over somebody's house and have a good time, right? You want to fellowship. You want to just hang out. We call fellowship hanging out today. That's in modern terms. We say hanging out. That's fellowship. We're eating. We're drinking. We're, we're dancing. We're doing all of these other things, and we call it fellowship, right? But what? At the end of the party, at the end of the, uh, of the hanging out, you go somewhere. You leave that place, right? But can I tell you, fellowship in the church, fellowship when it comes to the Father, when it comes to the Son, is deeper than that. Because you don't just hang out with God. You start to speak like God. You start to think like God. Because God's word is commanding us to imitate him. And who is the him? The him is his son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that here in a moment. But I want you to understand that the gospel produces fellowship. It produces fellowship. How? In eternal life. Because if you look at verse 3, it says that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. Right? So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, who? Jesus Christ. Fellowship, or, or salvation produces, or, or the proclamation of the gospel, I'm sorry, it, it, it produces fellowship in eternal life, and in turn fellowship in eternal life, it produces then joy. That's how you have joy. Eternal life brings joy. You can be up one day, you can be down the next day, but let me tell you, there should be a joy in your heart because you know that if anything ever happens to you, you're going to be present with the Lord throughout eternity. Throughout eternity. It produces joy. So, what is the conduct of our fellowship. If you go to chapter 2 now, he, 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 del he delves into it right now. And he really describes the character of our conduct. In verses 3 through 11 of 1 John 2, notice it says, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Y'all see that? He says, <laughs> by this, we know that we come to know him if we keep his commandments. Come to know him, that's fellowship, if we keep his commandments. Notice, the scripture then also says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. I didn't call you a liar. The Bible did. Okay, so don't, you don't have a beef with me. Okay, the Bible says you are a liar. This is one of the very few scriptures that if you look at the words that is, are written, and if you do not believe what has been written, then God says you're a liar. That's what he says. Let, I'm going to read it again. Because <laughs> y'all looking at me funny. Whoever says, I know him. If you say, I know him. I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But does not keep his commandments. And, and what's his commandments? His commandments is to love your brother. His commandments is to love the saints of God. His commandments is to know more about Christ. That's his commandments. And he says, but does not keep his commandments. In other words, you don't even pursue righteousness. You don't even want to have fellowship with your brothers. You don't want to have fellowship with any of those things because it involves other people. Then you can't say you know him. That's what, that's what God is saying. You can't say you know me. Because what did I say? Fellowship is a partnership. It's a partnership 
because you are partaking in eternal life that God gave you. It's a partnership with the redeemed. It's a partnership with God. And so he says, and keep on reading, but whoever keeps his word, y'all see that? In him, truly, the love of God is perfected. It's made whole. If you keep his word. Now, how many of you have kept God's word all the time? No, we, we, no nobody should be holding their hands up, right? We haven't, we haven't, see, Perfection is not something God expects of you because God is perfect. But if you keep his word, if you pursue righteousness, you may fall down every now and then. God, he will, he will complete you. He will make you whole. He will pick you up. He will dust you off. And he will say, keep pursuing my word. God has never said that you need to live a sinless life. Well, if you were able to live a sinless life, why did Jesus come? What was his purpose? If you can live a sinless life. Then if you can live a sinless life, then there would be no need for Jesus to come to die on the cross for sins. But the, reason, the fact of it is, is that we needed Jesus because why? Because we could not meet the standards of God. We could not meet his holiness requirements. And so God initiated, initiated fellowship with us. He initiated fellowship with us by what? Sending his only begotten son. To die for the sins of the world. And now he says, if you do not keep my word and you say you know me, you're a liar. But those who do keep my word, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. By what? By you keeping your word, by you keeping God's word. We may know that we are in him. So he's telling us how you to act in fellowship. The first thing you need to do is, you, well, it's not a first, second, or third, but here it is. You need to imitate Christ. It's imitation. You need to imitate Christ. How do you imitate Christ? You do what Christ did. What did Christ do? He prayed to the Father. What did Christ do? Christ spoke the word of God to others. How did he treat other people? He didn't treat them with hate. He didn't reject them. But no, he loved them. He served men. The scripture says that Christ says that he did not come to be served, but to serve. Now, wait a minute. If Christ didn't come to be served, why am I waiting to be served? I'm out of order. I'm out of, a, I'm out of alignment with God's word right there when I expect people to serve me. Are you greater than Jesus? Jesus says, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. And here it is, we need to understand, is that you need to know and you need to keep. That's the key to imitation. Know, keep. The repetition of these words emphasizes that those genuinely born again they display the habits of obedience. You know, and you keep. You know, you keep. It's not enough just to know. 
Let me just throw that out there. You have to act in obedience on what you know. And we have too many confused people today because they got so much knowledge, but they're not doing any keeping. They're not acting in obedience to God's word. They got it up here. But they don't have it down here. Feet is what? Is to walk in obedience. Walking in obedience is putting one foot ahead of the other. One foot ahead of the other. Babies knew this at a very young age. Have you ever seen a baby trying to walk the first time? They put one foot in front of the other. They fall, but they keep doing it over and over again. What I'm telling you is that you're not going to always get it right. But you got to get back up and you got to keep moving forward. That's the key to imitation. You got to keep moving. And that's that's what is very clear here. And we need to understand. That. Jesus life of obedience is the Christian's pattern. We need to copy Jesus. Copy Jesus. When you imitate Christ, you won't go wrong. Those who claim to be Christians ought to live as Jesus did. And you say, well, how can I live as Jesus did? Well, you have the presence of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. He gives you power. His presence alone will allow you to imitate Christ. Oh, we got so much power, y'all. We got a lot of power. And you don't even know it. The sad fact of it is, is the enemy wants to make sure you uh, make, make you think you're weak. You're torn down. You no good for nothing. But can I? you that we got a power that renews us day by day that gives us strength that tells us that we are beautiful that we are beloved and that let me tell you that God is going ahead of us and he's already won the victory you keep believing in Christ keeping his word knowing who he is And this is what it means to walk in the light when you know who you are. You walk into the room and people say, wow, that person looks confident. You are confident because you got power. You have power. You go to that job interview, you don't go in there weak, feeble. You go in there with confidence. We talked about confidence last uh, week, didn't we? Go in there with confidence. Because greater is he who is on inside of you than he who is in the world. You have already overcome whatever the world may throw at you. It's the character of our conduct is that we are to imitate Christ. That's how we ought to act in fellowship. Every one of us, when we come to, together, we ought to, some, we ought to see Christ in you. And those that we don't see Christ in, then we need to pray for them, and we need to yoke up with them, and we need to pour into them. There's a way of doing these things. And God will lead you in yoking with someone who needs to be poured into. I thank God that someone poured into me. I thank God that I have been able to pour into other people's lives. People that I have not even seen in a long time. But God allowed me to intersect their life so that he could be glorified. 
person can see who they are in Christ. But then also there's another conduct and fellowship you, you need to be aware of. And then it, it's, it calls for separation. There needs to be some separation done. Look at verse 12. Go, go to verse 12. He says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the word, world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the father, but is from the what world and the world is passing away along with his desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. How you ought to act in fellowship is you need to imitate Christ. You need to know and you need to keep his commandments. But then you also, there is a commandment here for our conduct in fellowship, and that is separation. Separation. You need to separate yourself from the world. And you may say, well, how in the world can I separate from my, myself from the world and I'm in the world? Well, you can be in the world, but not of the world. All right. Notice he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. All right. Y'all see that? Do not love the world. And it's important for us to see this because uh, uh, it, it's because we know that the importance of love. Is shown from God. Because God is love. He's love. Right. And so he also reveals that God hates a certain type of love and that is the love of the world he hates that type of love because the world goes against the love of God the world speaks against God I don't have to prove that to you you can just look at social media and you can see it <clears throat> you can see that there are more people who are following people who said that there is no God the Bible says that the, the heart at its root is evil. Man's heart is evil. And what we need to understand is that if you are in this world, you will experience a certain type of love that is not of God. Oh, I, I, can, I can be all day on this one. I can, there's so many things that happen in this world that is not of God and God hates it and he gives us watch this a commandment for your uh, our conduct if you are having fellowship with me then do not love the world you cannot love the world and love God did you know that you can't do it you either love the one or hate the other but you can't love God and the world you because God, he has a higher standard than the world. The world has nothing for you. God has eternal life for you. God has blessings for you. Well, <clears throat> can the world give you material things? Yes, the world can give you material things. But we just read it will pass away. Didn't it? That's what we just read. <clears throat> the material stuff is going to be burned it's going to be it's going to pass away that car you love that house you love <clears throat> will all go away 
But God is eternal. He's eternal. And so the commandment is to separate <coughs> from the world. Do not love the world or the things uh, of uh, uh, in the world, he says. OK. So <coughs> he's basically given us a test of love. And God gives you a test. And the test is, do you love me or do you love the world? And we all go through that test. It's what you put before anything else. Do you put God's word ahead of life decisions in your life? When you have to make a critical decision in your life, do you go to God or do you go to the world? You got to ask yourself that. Who am I speaking to when I when I am making life decisions? Am I speaking to people on the social media platform who never opened up a scripture, never read a, 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 a verse of scripture from the Bible? But they're telling you how you can be successful based on what they believe. And we got so many people who are adopting world values. You are adopting world values when you follow the world. But God is saying, I don't want my children adopting world values. You need to look like my son. You need to look like Jesus. Because he was my only begotten son that sacrificed his own life for the sins of the world. That's love. That's love. The world cannot give you what God can. No, it won't happen. And, and we need to understand that, that, that love, it, here it, it signifies affection and devotion. Who are you devoted to? Are you devoted to God? Are you devoted to God? Who are you giving your affection to? So there needs to be separation. But then also in fellowship, there is an affirmation. That's really the creed of our conduct. It's an affirmation. If you look at verse 18, it says children. It is the what? It is. The last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. All he said is that we're living in the last days. At any moment, the script can be flipped. And guess what? The Antichrist could be here. The one who goes against Christ, who blinds so many people from the truth. But then he says, they went out from us in verse 19, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Notice fellowship is that you're continuing with the believers. There are some people who have left the faith. Are they in fellowship with the believers? No, because they've left. They started with us, but they're now no longer with us. And, and can I tell you that, no, they didn't just go and join another church. They didn't go to another, no, they left the faith. They left God's word. And they attached their affections to the love of the world. Notice he then says, he says, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. It was very evident. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. Oh, that's an affirmation. You've been anointed by the Holy One. You've been set apart. In fellowship with God, here it is. The creed of our conduct is that he sets you apart. 
When you start to think negative of yourself, you need to have this affirmation that, no, uh -uh, I've been anointed by the Holy One. I've been anointed by God. Notice, and he says, and you all have what? Knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. You know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Look at the affirmations. God says, I've given you the knowledge. You know the truth, beloved. Don't ever let anybody trick you or pull the rug up under you in your faith and make you, and make you doubt what God has said to you. But we need to keep his word. We need to know his word. And those really, that's the conduct and fellowship is that we imitate Christ and that we separate from the world and then we receive the affirmation of God that you are anointed of God and you know the truth. And you know what? When you fellowship with God, there should be joy. There should be happiness. Why? Because we are all beloved in Christ. Jesus Christ came and died for our sins so that we may know the love of God. We may know who he is. We may have fellowship with him. And when he died on the cross, he connected us to God. And now that we do know him, what do we know? We know that he died on the cross for our sins. We know that he was buried. We know that he rose again on the third day with all the power of heaven and earth in his hands. We know this. Now our joy is made complete. We're perfected. Why? Because we know who he is and we pursue righteousness. We're walking in obedience to him. That's fellowship. Fellowship is just not having a potluck. Fellowship is coming together and you are enjoying each other's partnership in Christ. And you are giving glory to God who initiated this fellowship. It's the fellowship of the believers. That's what John is saying here. But you can't have fellowship if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Make the decision today. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until tonight. Do it right now. And say, Lord, I want to have fellowship with you. And all you have to do is confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Ask him to come into your heart. Give him your life. Turn away from your sin. Run to Jesus. Right now, before it's too late. And then you will have fellowship with God. We're so grateful and thankful, Lord. Because, God, you are amazing. You are amazing, God. We thank you for your word. Now we ask, Father, that you will now complete our joy. Complete our joy in your word, Lord. I pray, Father, for those who have been pursuing you, that, Lord, you would give them strength. And, Lord, I pray for those who have fallen off somewhere down the road. I pray, Lord, that you would pick them back up and put them back on the right path. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask that someone got saved today by hearing your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.